Hi, good morning. <coughs> so I'm, I'm going to go quite experimental on this one. So I'm, there's, there's no maths at all in this one, so you'd be glad to know. So um, I'm talking about source code. I'm too young, exactly. I don't have the maths, so I'm going to have to do something a bit more uh, practical here. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about source pull, and that includes the fundamental source pull and harmonic source pull, and look at some of the, the things on that. And really, I, I was starting off with the, the fundamental source pull, and, and asking the question, you know, what, what should it achieve? Because I know you, you go around the industry and talk to different people, and people have different views on, on fundamental source pull. Some are saying it's all to do with energy into the device, yeah? so that's all that matters. You change the fundamental source impedance, you get more power or less power into your transistor, and it doesn't really affect output performance of the transistor at all. It doesn't change efficiency or power. And then there's people you talk to, lots of people actually, who, who say, I've definitely seen improvements, dramatic improvements, just by changing my fundamental and retooking my load impedance. I can actually gain, gain, gain improvements with that. So I wanted to try and be a bit more systematic and try experimentally to see does that exist or not, really. And then the second part, really, looking at harmonics and the effect of harmonics at source side and the they affect and are we seeing things from the second harmonic and third harmonic impedances that actually change the way the device is working? And finally, I, I wrapped that into a model. So we do, we do these Cardiff models at, at, uh, at Focus these days. And can that model then predict those effects that we see? So that's my setup. So I have a, a PNAX, and I have a phase reference. Oops, not passed. Phase reference over here, which is tracking the time doing waveforms. And I guess the important bit's really the tuners here. So I've got two, two passive tuners, but they're harmonic tuners. So they have control of the second and third harmonic as well as the fundamental. So that lets you either fix or actually control the harmonic impedances. So you can try and sort of isolate the effect of the fundamental. So now we can hold the second and third harmonics at 50 ohms and then see what actually happens when we change the fundamental impedance. I'm not sure we need that one really. That's a single stub tuner, and that's what we, we're using here. So we actually have control now of, independently of three harmonics with a single tuner. So that's, the, that's what we're trying to show works or not. So it, when we vary the fundamental source impedance, what actually happens? Do we just end up changing the transducer again, or do we actually change the performance of the device? So the green line here is actually my tuning range on this setup. So I've, I've got a tuning range here. This is what the system told me I input my device was. So the optimum match would obviously be the conjugate of that. And I've taken three points. So I've taken one of 50 ohms, one sort of halfway out there, and one somewhere towards this sort of conjugate match of the device. And then I've locked basically the output. So I said, well, I'll present my optimum match at the fundamental and terminate the harmonics in 50 ohms. I'm going to keep my harmonic source impedance of 50 ohms. I'm just going to vary the fundamental source and see what happens. So you end up with three different plots, and three different source impedances. Obviously, the transducer gain changes. So you change from one, one impedance to the next. You get more or less transducer gain. But really, we don't, we don't know what happens. So I mean, looking at available power in is not the way to do it. So if we change it now to look at delivered power and then overlay the plots, so we can actually start overlaying these things, we can actually see they all line up. See, all you're doing is moving along the same power transfer curve as you change source impedance, which is trying to tell you that, you know, all you're doing really is actually controlling the energy going into your device. So you're not actually changing anything. You're still moving up and down the same, same set of power and efficiency curves as you do that. And obviously you can do the same thing then with the output contours. So I'm going to do the same sort of experiment. My output side is controlled again in the same uh, optimum impedances. I'm just changing the fundamental source impedance. And then looking at my power contours, you can see here the power contours for the, for the different states. And you, you don't actually get any, any difference. Yeah? So they're, they're, they're pretty much the same contours, no matter what the, the source impedance is, once you start to equalize that power. So the question is, do we actually need fundamental source pull? I guess there's a couple of reasons to do it anyway, whether it actually affects performance or not. Number one, you may want to match your device, because chucking lots of power away when, when the device has a very high, uh, uh, low input impedance is a bad idea. And also, if you have a power meter based setup with a uh, passive Tina, and you don't know the input impedance of the device, that's an important thing to know. If you're designing a, trans uh, a PA, you need to know the optimal match at the source side. 
So I was going to move on and to look at harmonics because uh, my assumption is that when people are seeing these differences in, in, in performance when they're doing source pull, what they're actually seeing is the, the tuner randomizing the, the harmonic impedances and then changing the performance of the transistor. Now, obviously, that's not, not what you want, really, because when you design the circuit, you don't know what that, what's happening there. We haven't done the same thing in the circuit, and you won't actually get the performance you expect. So I set up the system this time. I got the MPT, which I've just done. This is the setup I just had. So my harmonics are 50 ohms. And we have a mode on the same tuner where you can actually turn it to single stub. And then the harmonics actually become a high reflect. Obviously, you have the fundamental way it was before, and you end up with second and third harmonics somewhere else. If you now compare the power suits, there's not a huge difference, but you can definitely see a difference this time. So you see about 0.2 dB difference in power and about 1% in efficiency. And that's all caused by the harmonic impedance varying uncontrollably, basically. So then what happens if we actually control that and actually do a full, full second harmonic sweep at the input side? So this is second harmonic source pole. And looking at the, the efficiency differences with everything else remaining constant. So we end up with a big minima down here and a big optima over here. But it's, it's about 10% efficiency swing, so it's quite considerable. It's not, it's not a small number. You know, if, you, if, you, if you ignore this thing, it could be very dangerous. And a passive tuner, a single stub passive tuner, would just give you any second harmonic. So as you move around your fundamental impedances, it's just randomizing that second harmonic and moving anywhere within this space. So you can have a big effect on the numbers you're going to get back from your, your system. And so now you, you can get very erroneous data if you don't understand what you've done with your local setup, basically. And there's the power plots with the three different positions. So my second harmonic 50 ohms, which is typical. Then over this way, in the bad place and the good place, and you see you know, the differences in the, in the power suits here are quite, quite notable, really. This is a question I had myself, you know, do we, do we recover the performance if we then change the fundamental impedance? Are we just moving things around? And quite often with transistors, you move one thing and then it just moves something else. And it means you may, maybe if I change the fundamental impedance somewhere else, I could get that performance back. It doesn't look like it happens. I mean, I got 70% in this one. And they're all really the same set of contours, just different second harmonic impedances. But you can see I don't recover the performance. I can't really move this fundamental impedance somewhere else and regain that performance. It is real. And this is now second harmonic load pull. So I'm thinking, you know, again, maybe it's somewhere else then. So I change the second harmonic. Can I recover that 70% if I change my second harmonic impedance? So again, the peak numbers have stayed the same, 72%, 67 and 63%. I still have that 10% swing. It does actually affect the, the optimal location as well, you see. So as you change that second harmonic source impedance, it can affect where the second harmonic optimal is at the output too. So if you just do output tuning, you could be making a mistake of where the optimum is at the second harmonic and the output too, if you don't look at where your second harmonic input was. So you really need the whole picture if you're going to do these tests in the lab. You need to have full control of the harmonics at the input side and the output side to fully understand what your circuit's going to do. And if you ignore that, you're going to basically make erroneous data and misunderstand where your output match needs to be. Which is what I've just said there, I think. Ignore your peril. You know, if, you don't, if you don't control the harmonics in the, in the system, you really need to understand what you're measuring. And really, the ideal measurement setup is to, to do full harmonics at the input and the output, and really understand and re recreate the system and the circuit you're trying to emulate, basically, with the system. So a little bit on the model now, and how we, you know, does the model capture all this information? Obviously, we've gone through that slide set, and now we want to make a model. So the, the Cardiff model is a behavioral model. It's filled using measurement data. So we've done some load pull and then filled the model. So we've done second harmonic source pull, second harmonic load pull. We filled that into a behavioral model. And now we're going to use that in the simulator to try and predict all these effects we've just seen, basically. It really needs to do two things, I think. So it needs to do this fundamental observation that the, the fundamental does nothing. So you, know, you, can, you can change the fundamental source impedance and then recreate that in simulation land and actually recreate the, the measurement data. And also, it needs to look at the complexity of the mixing between the harmonics, too. So the second harmonic input affecting the output side, it needs to capture all this information. So what I've done then is I've captured the model in one source impedance. So I've used 50 ohms. So I've ignored the source pull tuner and just done a 50 ohm extraction. 
and then we're going to look at the effect of moving that, that source impedance in the simulator and then recreating that in the measurement setup. So trying to compare something I didn't actually use to fill the simulator to, to the simulated values. This is just the output contours. This is showing the, the sort of fundamental behavior of the model. So this is the model over this side here, and this is the measured data. And you can see in 50 ohms, it does a very good job. So it's got a good, good agreement in power and efficiency. It tracks, tracks the local contours very well here. And that's the state we actually fill the model with. So the source impedance is 50 ohms. And these are my power suits in that 50 ohms. And you get, obviously, very good agreement, modeled and measured. Very, very small differences in P out and gain and efficiency between the modeled and measured performance. Almost too good. <laughs> I see your face. You're not, you're not going to the oh, okay, yeah. You want to say lookup table. Okay. So this is a new source impedance now. So I've changed the source impedance to, to a different uh, source impedance. And I've redone a measurement and compared back to my simulator. And you can see it tracks very well. So it's got the GT right. It's got all the power curves right. It's done a very good job of doing the same thing as I said. I mean, it's just changing the power going into the simulator. And again, another one there. So now the gain's high. And we get very good agreement all the way along. So what it's telling you is you don't need to do model extraction at different source impedances. You can do 50 ohms, and then the model will deal with that, and there's, there is no problem. And there's the final plot showing the source pool contour, basically. So this is my measured source pool contour with my optimum over here. I picked three points on my simulator as well, so I picked the optimum, which is here, and it's agreeing 21.19 in gain. 50 ohms is about 14.63, and then up here somewhere, 10.13, 10.18. So it does a very good job of actually doing that source pool within the simulator. You don't need to do it as a real measurement. That's what I just said. So we don't, you don't really need the resource pool. We can just uh, fill it with one, one impedance and then use the simulator to actually predict what's going to happen with different source impedances. So this is now looking at um, the harmonic stuff. So we've got the mixing model, like I just said. We've filled it with second harmonic input and output data. And we're going to use it now to look at the effects of the harmonics and see how well it deals with that. This is the second harmonic uh, source pool contour, one we saw in the previous slides. And this is the measurement again and the simulated performance. So again, it's getting the optimum in the right place. This may be a little bit further around. These are very weak contours up here. But it does a good job with that second harmonic source pool capturing. And again, then looking at the, the second one, output condos again. So we're looking at output performance. Again, you get a maximum and a minimum in a different place this time. This is all measurement data. And then the corresponding simulators, which you see these things moving in the right way. So my, my minima tracking like it did here. And my optima is moving the same way as well. So it's, it's captured all that information within the model. And the important thing, I guess, it, it captures these, these harmonic cost products. So you, know, you can see how different harmonics affect other harmonics within the simulator too. I guess I've done a pretty good job of keeping very quick. And Steve could have had another 10 minutes. Well, not 10 minutes to ask, <coughs> ask, him, ask, them, ask that there, don't ask me. <laughs> so I think we've shown that you know, I've, I've looked a lot at fundamental source pull and harmonic source pull and tried to show some of the importance of that. I think the take-home message for me was you, know, you really need to look at these things as a system and think, I need to look at the harmonics, not just the output, but the input too. I think it's important to look at that on both sides of the device. And I think we're showing the model does a reasonably good job of fitting data. I know Steve has many views on this, which we could go on for a long time, but um, I think the behavioral models have their place. I think you know, they, they, they're useful in refitting measured data and, and giving the ability to use it in the simulator and produce designs. So. <laughs>